If you just started going down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin, you should definitely, besides, you know, all the other books that are out there, you know, the Genius book by Safira Namus, you know, Bitcoin Standards, there's one book that you definitely need to read, and that is Layered Money by Nick Batia. Uh, either it's a book, ebook, or hardcover. It's called Layered Money from Gold and Dollars to Bitcoin and Central Bank Digital Currencies. It talks about, it goes deep dive into the evolution of monetary systems around the globe and into the origins of how money has evolved in, into function in a layered man manner. So we're going to go down different rabbit holes. And so I'm really looking forward to my special guest, Nick Batia. He's an adjunct uh, professor uh, at the University of Southern California, Marshall School of Business uh, for Finance and Business Economics, financial researcher. So without further ado, this is my talk with Nick Batia. Let me know if you have any questions, comments. Make sure you follow me, follow Nick Batia on Twitter. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast show. And let me know your questions. And my email DMs are open. Have fun. Nick, Nick Batia, thanks so much for coming on my show. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Nick, uh, um, I've been following you for quite some time. I've, uh, you, you've written a brilliant book. It's, it's, it's the challenging part, I think, is, and you mentioned it in one of your other podcasts or interviews, um, maybe not challenge, but I think it was also the intention to put it in a succinct manner. Because I think if it was like a more like comprehensive book, I'm not sure whether you know, the average person would have read it. What do you think? I agree. I actually had a lot of help from family and friends in terms of helping me refine the message and to some, you know, close people to me that they're not necessarily Bitcoiners or finance people. Uh, they said, you know, the, the first half is really good. I'm enjoying it. But then you're starting to lose me as we get into the dollar, as we get into the Fed. Uh, some of the later Bitcoin stuff and the CBDC chapter as well. So I, I had to dial back a lot of the detail. I had to uh, really make it more clear so that anybody can pick up this book. And that was my goal with Layered Money is write a book that explains money to somebody who isn't necessarily a finance person, has never taken an accounting course. You know, I'm an adjunct professor at... Uh, University of Southern California here in here in Los Angeles and my students have a prerequisite of accounting and some sort of micro or macroeconomics so you have to have an understanding of discounting cash flows and uh, assets and liabilities to take my class but I didn't want that to be the case for the book I wanted it to be something that anybody could read Hey, um, you just mentioned your, you know, your professor. Uh, I was going to ask you, like, what is um, because you know, with Bitcoin, once you go into the rabbit hole, Bitcoin for the first time, you face this fundamental, you know, uh, never, never experienced question, like, what is money? Um, now, with your book, the you know, layered money. Uh, what's the subtitle? It's from from gold to to yes, to... it's from gold and dollars to Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. So the you know the 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 past layers are gold and the dollar system. The future uh, is Bitcoin and all other digital currencies. Okay, what is? Let me ask you first. What is uh, what is the motivation and the intention and the call to action when you wrote that book? I mean, you wanna I guess you wanna you know cause an effect um, because I was thinking, what if you know, your book or maybe maybe other books like, like Safida Namus were taught at schools, you know, not only at universities, at colleges, but like at schools, you know, like for, uh, for the mature mind. How would people, you know, change a behavior uh, monetary-wise, economically, in, 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 uh, in terms of comprehension? That's a great question. Yeah, the call to action of the book is to express that Bitcoin is a freedom tool and that our current monetary system doesn't have to be tied to governments in the way that it currently is. This idea of separation of money and state is something that is well known to people in Bitcoin and something that they advocate for. Uh, and so I wanted to tell that story properly, how money and state merged and why it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. 
and how Bitcoin is a tool of empowerment and it because it's a denomination. And so one thing I do in the book is I trace the root of the word denomination. The root is nomen. It means name in Latin. So a denomination is how we name our wealth. How do we name our labor? And how do we name our blood, sweat, and tears? If you have, if you are locked in to a denomination, meaning you don't have freedom of denomination, then that is in antithesis of freedom and uh, things that I believe in, that we should be free to do things on this planet. Not that, um, you know, governments need to go away tomorrow, but that I should have the right to denominate my labor or my savings in any currency that I choose. Bitcoin gives the world for the first time the ability to denominate their wealth, their earnings, their labor in a different currency that's not tied to a government that isn't subject to devaluation from any central party. And so these are like classic Bitcoin, um, uh, you know, these are classic Bitcoin explanations, motivations, but I did want to encapture all these ideas of freedom of currency denomination, which is the title of the conclusion, chapter 10, and this idea that money and state merged in the 17th century um, formally and, you know, uh, for quite some time before that, if you want to go back to the Roman Empire. And uh, it doesn't have to be like that going forward. And we can use government currencies and Bitcoin in tandem together as separate tools for separate things. That's, that's fascinating you that you just, just brought here because I was going to bring up that that uh, quote that you wrote. I have the ebook, so I can't give you the, the page number, but I guess you know what I'm talking about. It is exactly that chapter, freedom of, of currency and denomina uh, denomination of currency denomination. And you, uh, it's your quote uh, quote out of your book. But in the digital age, money and state don't necessarily mix anymore. To many, the entire concept of government money is becoming obsolete. On the rise of uh, as the rise of Bitcoin bellows in antithesis. I'm not sure whether people really are grasping the fundamental nature, the fundamental implications, what that means, you know, for, the, for, for, uh, for us as a society, as an individual, as a sovereign individual, as human civilization. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, in the West, uh, you're in Europe, I'm in the United States, it's harder for people to grasp this idea that we don't need our government currencies and we don't need them. Uh, it, I think the people that own Bitcoin in the West are doing so um, either because they have an advanced understanding of the technology uh, or they have an advanced understanding of the monetary system. So I would classify myself as the latter. I have an advanced understanding of our monetary system. And for that reason, I'm seeking a wealth storage tool that doesn't have to do with the dollar system. Uh, many Bitcoiners in the United States and Europe are doing that same thing. There are also, of course, the first adopters in the West that were doing so because they understood what a brilliant technology Bitcoin was and is. So that's what the motivation in the West has been. But you have to step into the shoes of people in Latin America and Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia that have currencies that are not stable, have no track record of stability, no, and they don't trust their governments at all as a populace. In the West, half the people trust the government and half the people don't. But in in Latin America and Africa, it's not like that. It's most people don't trust the government. Most people don't trust the currency. Most people have other ways to store their money besides their own government currencies, like US dollar paper money, right? That is one of the primary wealth storage tools in Latin America and Africa is Benjamin's dollar bills, right? And so they understand this idea fundamentally that we don't need government currencies. People in the United States and Europe, generally speaking, 
as a populace don't have that. So it, it really is a, a tale of two worlds here. Um, and both, I think that both uh, the West and um, other parts of the world that don't have trustworthy government currencies are speaking to each other over the last three, four years of this Bitcoin, uh, this rise of Bitcoin beyond the computer science contingent. As the global banking system, central banks, and the international community starts talking about Bitcoin as they have over the last half decade, both sides of the story are, are speaking to each other. Uh, people that are writing about human rights in Bitcoin, like Alex Gladstein, for example, he's bringing messages from Venezuela and other parts of Latin America to us in the United States, how Bitcoin is being used. Um, people like Matt Alborg, that are doing research in Nigeria on how Bitcoin is being used are bringing that knowledge to us. They know that we're buying Bitcoin because we want the price to go up and we, we are not agreeing with the Fed and the ECB unlimited QE policies. But we have to understand why they're buying it. And they're not, listen, they're not buying it. They are allocating to it in their daily activities to build in a protection mechanism for their earnings and their wealth. We have to understand them. And part of my book was, you know, bring a, an example of somebody in Nigeria that uses Bitcoin for empowerment. Understand, make people understand that the West and the East or the Southern Hemisphere are different in their approaches to Bitcoin. And so those were some of my goals with layered money. Would you say that the, the as a, if I want to reuse Parker Lewis term, the gradual and sudden, um, gradual and suddenly um, phrase, um, would you say the adoption rate could, could be like surprising in some parts of the world as you, as you've been, you know, just describing on whatever continent, would it be South America, Latin America, uh, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, or you know, Iran, Venezuela? You would you could you anticipate that? Do you think we could anticipate that? Yes, like all I think that yes, I think that there are countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America that could have, and I think it would come from um, something more official, like a government announcement. Uh, where you could see Bitcoin adoption happen extremely quickly and go from 5% to 90% in, in the span of one year. Uh, I think that could happen if, for example, a government makes an announcement that we are going to semi back our currency with Bitcoin, the central bank has purchased Bitcoin so that we can stabilize our currency or things like we're abandoning our currency. I mean, something like that I couldn't necessarily imagine it happening in the next 12 months, but it could surprise us. And if it does happen in the next five years, in any of those countries, Bitcoin adoption goes to 90 plus percent in any of those countries, essentially overnight. So I do feel like going forward, we're going to have less currencies in five years than we do today, government currencies. Currencies will cease to exist because they can't compete with the dollar and Bitcoin. They're just outcompeted, and it's uh, it's too expensive to try to stabilize your currency in Bitcoin terms or in dollar terms for some of these countries. And by too expensive, I mean they have to then turn the printing press on their own printing press to support their currency, you know. And um, they it, it's the, that's not a sustainable situation. Um, for a currency that doesn't have this type of global reserve status that the dollar and the euro have. You know, for people who might come, you know, totally as noobs or just curious, out of curiosity because it, whatever, Bitcoin has become mainstream or fine, you know, because of number go up, they're finally coming into this space. And could you describe to some of these people, 
you know, with all the properties of Bitcoin, you know, full auditability, transparency, instantaneous settlement, not only on chain, but, you know, with, with the rapidly evolving technologies of whatever Jack Mahler's strike or second, third layer, whatever, the, uh, you know, might come. So the, all, this whole, there's a whole paradigm shift going on. Is, is, there, is it possible for you to describe a world, how, what the world could look like? Or, or what are like, or let's 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 be a little bit more specific. Like uh, the reduction in damages, collateral damages, you know, on a societal level, on economical level. Um, do you want to comment on that? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be very honest with you. There are you know people like Robert Breedlove that they're building a whole school of thought around the question that you just asked. What are the societal benefits going forward from this type of change? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna not answer the question other than just saying, I believe Bitcoin is a force for good. It will change the world for the better and that we will have less collateral damage from monetary systems in the future than we do today. That is part of that is part of why I believe in Bitcoin. It's part of why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin. But there are great uh, writers right now and philosoph philosophers, new Bitcoin philosophers that are exploring these topics. So I would point people to Robert Breedlove and other you know writers out there that are doing a fantastic job of reimagining our future and whatever societal benefits that we'll get from a Bitcoin centric monetary system yeah and i also you know i've I have had uh jeff booth on also on the show he's I, I love his his perspectives and his comprehension of what you know deflation means deflation economics and that the, the technology is is inherently deflationary and what that could mean you know rooted in or i can imagine you know uh what you're describing in your book you know layered money but in rooted in bitcoin with all the technologies beyond you know the digital realm uh and what that could you know uh, uh, uh trigger a cascade of chain reaction in the technological sector in the societal sector uh what have you okay um there's another quote which I wrote down. It says, uh, "All cashiers, um, all cashiers were forced to surrender precious metal to the Bank of Amsterdam, and were issued Bank of Amsterdam deposits in return." And you describe, you know, this this was actually the first central bank. Uh, and what I really find shocking or insightful, you, and you write, you continue writing, and you say. It was sort of a purview into the financial relationships between its patrons, and I want to you know make this connection to the central bank digital currencies. What kind of hugely potential mis abuse or misuse of all these data? I mean, of the centralized control. I mean, they're already having such a centralized control. They're untouchable. They have criminal immunity. You know, starting from the Bank of International Settlement, which I wanted to have your opinion to. What is the role? Because I knew you know you wanted to keep it short and compact. Mm -hmm. But is there like, um, um, do you have an opinion on the on the role of the Bank of International Settlement and on that quote uh, with the you know with the with all these intricacies that we could we could be facing? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So let's start with the this uh, purview, this concept of a uh, purview from the CBDC perspective. Yes, right now, the ability to analyze financial relationships between people is at the commercial banking level because people use the banking system to transfer money to each other and to store money in, de in deposit form. So when the government tries to surveil its populace and see what are our citizens doing? What kind of uh, shenanigans are they getting up to? What kind of things can we censor or legislate against? Or who can we go after? Who can we tax? Who's evading taxes? All of these things have to be done with a joint banking government cooperation and the Fed also as the whole regulatory framework for the banking system. CBDCs 
if they are starting to replace the banking system as the way people store their money, then that gives the government the ability to skip over this having to go to the banks to audit their records and or, or even the ability for banks to launder money for people if it's going all the way there. Now, in the U.S., it's going to be slow. We're not all going to be using Fed coins very soon. Uh, I think that's very far away. But we, we do have to imagine these sort of things. And uh, yeah, it does bring, it does bring uh, this idea of financial surveillance into the forefront and make us think that, wow, if we have Fed coins uh, or digital euros, the ECB and the Fed, they can see everything that we're doing. Uh, that's just the natural result of us having a wallet with their coin in it. You know um, how much uh, blockchain forensics go on in Bitcoin today. So imagine all that power with the Fed without having to design software for it. They built it from the beginning to be able to watch everything, to have flags go up when things go on that don't meet their eye. And so that's, you know, um, going to be interesting. Um, and I, I forget the second part of your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, no, but uh, what is, what do you think is the role of the Bank of International Settlements? Right. So that's going to be interesting. It might become a clearinghouse for CBDCs. Um, they might set um, some sort of guidance on how CBDCs should be issued, what type of software distributed ledger technology technology should be used, um, what type of swaps are allowed between digital uh, currencies from, from country to country or from central bank to central bank. So I'm not sure, but what I do know is that the BIS is one of the thought leaders in central bank digital currencies. They are hesitant, but willing to credit Bitcoin as the inspiration for a lot of it. Um, at least they were at the beginning. And now they're trying to pretend that Bitcoin doesn't exist so they can build their uh, financial system in their own eye. Because if they have to admit that government currencies aren't demanded as much today as they were yesterday, then that shakes up their framework. They have to think with blinders on. So. Uh, I do see them as a as kind of the guiding ship for central bank digital currencies, and they've published a lot of papers, and now they have regular uh, publications on what we what they believe the technology should be. Um, and again, nothing to do with Bitcoin right now at the BIS uh, at all. Yeah. Because um, I did a lot of uh, reading about the Bank of International Settlement, whatever material was available. And I mean, as far as I informed, the Bank of International Settlements is owned, right, by the majority of the you know biggest central bank or the owners and shareholders of the central banks. But it's all you know very mystified, and <laughs> obscure. So this is something, you know, a topic of real um, thrilling interest to me. Um, Okay, so there's no coincidence that you wrote an excellent article today, uh, why $1 million Bitcoin is coming. And I see you probably in a few months with another article where you say again, oh, this was too bearish. <laughs> so <laughs> do you want to like um, comment a little bit on your, on your article? How, how did you get to write this article? Yeah, uh, Coindesk approached me and uh, they said, uh, you know, we can see that uh, your book is gener generating a lot of interest in the community and we'd love to have you write an opinion piece for us. So uh, I accepted and I really appreciate their offer and uh, was really happy to write something. And so they said, you can write whatever you want. So I thought about what to write about and I didn't want to bore anybody with uh, going on about layered money because um, I've been doing that <laughs> for several weeks now. And, uh, you know, pe the book is out there. People are loving it and recommending it. So, you know, I did, I wanted to write something fresh and uh, I thought about what was the biggest news item since I published the book. And it was the purchase of $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin by Tesla. And so I, you know, been just thinking about how 
Bitcoin is moving in layered money. I use gold as this reference point. Uh, I tell a thousand year story about gold and I even use the current market value of gold as a you know, reference point to where Bitcoin's price could reach you know, in the next few years, which is approximately $500,000 given a market cap of $10 trillion worth of gold. So divided by about 20 million coins, we get about $500,000 Bitcoin. Now that was, um, I, think, I think it was a, a good way for me to ground my book and to ground the readers in you know, imagining the future and you know, uh, where Bitcoin could go. But now that we look at corporate treasuries coming into Bitcoin, what I thought about, I said, what if you know, there was a trillion dollars in demand that came into Bitcoin with Bitcoin at a market cap of one trillion? Would that mean that Bitcoin doubles to two trillion in market cap? Oh no, <laughs> it's going to go multiples of that. So, so then I thought, how can we estimate? Because it's impossible to calculate. But how can we estimate the multiplier effect of these huge purchases? So I toyed with a lot of numbers, and I did a very unscientific way. But I basically, you know, attributed one-sixth of the most recent price rise of Bitcoin to uh, the purchases from Tesla and MicroStrategy since December. And, you know, when we think about it, this is like a, you know, how should I call it? We, we say in German, it's sort of a, 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 a small drop on a hot stone. So, um, I mean, you know, when BlackRock comes and says like, you know, sort of make their semi-official statements with a dabbling in, you know, I mean, they've got like trillions and trillions of assets on the management. So we haven't really seen the, the you know, the huge chunks uh, of uh, not even to mention pension funds. I mean, this could go so fast, exponentially fast and surprisingly fast. Uh, I think we can't even fathom uh, because we're what at a trillion dollar market cap. That's what one tenth of our already of our gold's market cap plus minus or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then with that, you know, of course, with the number go up, you know, and going mainstream, it creates this 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 uh, self feeding prophecy or what do you call it? This self fulfilling prophecy. And uh, as um, as uh, uh, who was it, Halfinio or Satoshi Nakamoto himself? He says, you know, you should get some in, in case if it catches on. So it creates this this demand. Um, and I was just talking to Hess McCook today because he writes really excellent article. I said, you know, what what would it take? Just uh, you know, forget all the institutions, the corporations, the average person, the plebs, as we you know we would call them, you know, uh, the average person out there, just to reach you know, uh, let's say a few trillion dollars market cap. And he said, you know, it would just take um, uh, maybe four percent of the population um, making ten ten dollars out of DCA every day or something like that. So it's really like like a super small critical mass that it will require to, you know, to reach that multi-trillion dollar market cap. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it is amazing. And that's what I wanted to do is just imagine, give people a little life to their imagination that $1 million Bitcoin is not that bullish. It's just not because if you look at the demand that could come into Bitcoin, all the people, institutions, companies, countries, central banks, banks that own zero Bitcoin, all the retirement investment funds that own zero Bitcoin. And now actually, by the way, most of them own some Bitcoin because most of them own some S&P 500, which owns Tesla, which owns Bitcoin. So now they are allocated, but in the most minute way, and yeah, I mean, a, a trillion dollars of demand coming into Bitcoin could trigger a $25 trillion increase in its market cap, which is a $1.3 million price of Bitcoin. So it actually is so much more easy. I mean, it's, it's really easier for me to imagine a million dollar Bitcoin in a post Elon world than it was before. And I've been very bullish on Bitcoin, you know, for, for a few years now. So uh, it was, you know, one of those rude awakenings to me that, wait a second, I'm not even bullish enough. And uh, so I wanted to write about that. 
You know, Nick, what is so uh, really mind boggling when you think about it and you, you wrote about that, you know, too, in your article, it's like, well, your book, like 12 years into its existence and it's, it's this monetary evolution at a, at a rate of speed we can't even fathom. I mean, when you compare that to the adoption rate of other technologies, I'm like, I was going to ask you, like, what would you say is the critical number of people, you know, adopting Bitcoin or whatever, hodling Bitcoin, saving Bitcoin, using Bitcoin? Would that be like half a billion people or even less? I, uh, I honestly think we passed it. Uh, during this pandemic uh, and the last uh, break really? above 20,000. I think we passed the point that um, that we're going to a billion. I mean, we've reached 100 million um, Bitcoin users or let's call it cryptocurrency users to be just more um, inclusive to this technology revolution. But we're talking about maybe 100 million people that own Bitcoin on some exchange or with their own custody around the world now. That, that is so, I mean, it's such a large number. It almost guarantees that we get to a billion. Um, you know, people are sending me DMs and saying, I'm buying 15 copies of your book from my friends and family. So amazing. Th this is, I mean, this is, this is the adoption multiplier. And when you, when you're at a hundred million people already and the number goes up and listen, also the people who are constantly dismissing Bitcoin are starting to look really silly. Uh, especially, not especially the so-called, you know, acad whatever intellectual branded people like, I mean, Nassim Taleb who wrote the forewords to, uh, yeah. you know, Safid, I mean, it's, I mean, it's getting a little bit embarrassing. I mean, what is, is your take on that? I mean, you know, they're making a clown of themselves. I mean, they're losing, they're insulting their own intelligence. This is what I'm concerned about, you know? They are, they are. They're not long enough. And that's the problem is that they're not long enough. And so, um, Dude, haters gonna hate. It's like uh, I don't know what better way to describe it. And um, Bitcoin derangement syndrome, isn't that what it's called? Bitcoin derangement syndrome is a great one. I haven't heard that one before, but it really is. I mean, it, listen, five years ago, when I'm falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and trying to debate Bitcoin with no coiners that's fun. And it's like, that's a challenge. And you have to sh try to show, you know, you have to show out of the box thinking today. I mean, if, if someone is trying to argue with you about Bitcoin, that like, it's a, uh, it's not backed by anything or like, it's a figment of your imagination or it's just a bubble and it's tulips all over again. You really shouldn't waste your time now. It, it just, it's like their time for you to uh, you know engage in that argument is it has passed. Uh, now we have to build a financial system, and you can. And this is now uh, you know here's a new way to respond to that argument, or like the government's going to ban Bitcoin. That's my favorite one. <laughs> it's like, um, excuse me, have you heard of a company called Coinbase? Do you think that the U.S. government is going to come in? and ban Bitcoin when companies like Coinbase and not to mention Fidelity Investments and Bank of New York Mellon have fully embraced this technology. It's like they're so uh, delusional. And um, that's part of why I wrote this article about Bitcoin going to a million because it's, it's, it's the time to like argue about Bitcoin's merits I think has passed. Let's actually shift the argument into how quickly is Bitcoin going to eat the monetary system? That is the new argument about Bitcoin, not whether or not it, it has merit. Uh, that is just, and you know, um, it's okay also that people don't want to adopt it yet. That makes, that makes um, the short cover <laughs> that more that much more violent in the future 
And that's, you know, it's what you see when the price goes up. It's a short covering in theory, because everyone is short Bitcoin until you own some. If the future of the monetary system is Bitcoin centric and you don't own any Bitcoin, then you're short Bitcoin. This is also a very popular meme that's taking root that I, that I love. If you're not long Bitcoin, you're short. I've been saying this for, for a long time and uh, been writing about it for a long time as well. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, Nick, what is your position? Because, you know, we've been talking, we've been having discussions with Dave Collum and Eric Glasquill previously, uh, uh, with Eric Kaysen also. Um, uh, you know, he, because Eric Glasquill always says, you know, Bitcoin is a black market money. And I think that, you know, it's not the concern that it, the government cannot, it, it, you know, it, you cannot ban Bitcoin. But what they could, and that, that is a concern, is sort of, uh, is there going to be a white market and black market? Is the government going to step in, in the intersection between users, merchants, you know, uh, in the transactional uh, level, on the transactional level, uh, when it comes to taxation, which is, you know, in whatever form, a form of a theft, a systemic theft. Um, do you think that's going to happen? I mean, you know, this, this splintering of, of markets, white market, black markets, or trying sort of to uh, tax people, you know? Well, it, it, it all comes down to taxes. So yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, ignore the first part of your question where you say, can the government come in and make a black market or white market? But let's focus on this idea of taxes and that Bitcoin gives people a, a route around it. And so that, that is one of the things that scares governments the most, if we're being frank, is the ability to evade taxes through a brand new denomination that they can't control and they don't have a central bank to wrap payments or to, to surveil. They have to surveil from the outside and they have to come in and collect taxes from the outside. And so governments will continue to tax, to levy tax on people um, and then the way that pe the people, and this is not United States or West centric, but the way that people engage with Bitcoin and the willingness that they have to convert their Bitcoin to domestic currency to pay a tax bill that's levied by their government, it's, it's going to change. It's going to change the way taxes are collected, taxes are levied, and the way that people, uh, the willingness of people to pay taxes and again, that comes back to the separation of money and state. And um, it's, all the same, it's all the same topic here, is that if we separate money and state, what is the true nature of the taxes that are levied today, uh, whether through inflation or income tax or other taxes? And so there's so many different types of taxes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that I'm passionate about, but... Um, but that, you know, it's, it's hard to speculate about what governments will do from a tax perspective. So it's going to be something I'm interested to watch. And I will, you know, look to see how governments are changing their attitude toward uh, tax collection in countries not named the United States of America. And see who are the leaders in a Bitcoin world. Is it going to be Singapore, Switzerland? Uh, what, which countries are going to be um, at the forefront in freedom of currency denomination? How can you show to the world that you are friendly to the idea of freedom of currency denomination? The United States, I promise you, won't be one of the first countries that makes that commitment. Singapore, Switzerland are two countries that are uh, very prominent countries on the world stage, are becoming very Bitcoin friendly. So I don't want to single them out as the two to watch, but let's watch them and the others that are making these types of uh, announcements um, to embrace Bitcoin. And I'm not saying the government of the United States or Europe is um, unfriendly. I would say the U.S. is very friendly relative to, let's say, Europe, who just seems so scared by Bitcoin. 
Uh, they seem scared out of their wits. Americans embrace the entrepreneurship mentality of Bitcoiners, I think, at a fundamental basis. We have people in Congress, both sides of the aisle, uh, that are very friendly to this idea that Bitcoin is a form of speech and a freedom tool and Americans should be allowed to use it as they so please. But, you know, let's watch, let's watch which countries say you may denominate everything in Bitcoin and um, you don't have to pay taxes when converting between uh, domestic currency and Bitcoin, uh, like at the top level. Let's watch and see who's there and what type of FOMO that creates in other countries that want to compete on the new world stage that aren't named, that aren't named you know, United States of America. Yeah, and if we stay in the United States, I mean, just look at Wyoming, interest state wise, I mean, this, 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 this rise of competition or not, you know, this special jurisdiction that's now being created, uh, sort of so called as Caitlin Long calls it crypto friendly, whatever. Um, do you see like more jurisdictional arbitrage? I mean, th I want to tie this in with my, you know, final wrap up question for you. Like, what is your vision for the next 10, 20 years? Is there going to be more competition, more free private cities? You know, if we, if I talk, if I, I talk to Tito Gable, a free private cities was really fascinating together with Jeff Booth. So, um, what is your vision? Like, what is your perspective for, for people, you know, who are seeking freedom or just want to, you know, live their lives, be an entrepreneur, uh, save money for themselves and their children, their posterity, um, you know, and, be, you know, and have a happy life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, you know, this is the stuff that Balaji Srinivasan talks about. It's the stuff that the Bitcoin Citadel uh, contingent loves to talk about. Um, but in the end, Jurisdictional arbitrage has absolutely dominated the way that business is done on the world stage for the for since I've been born. And so to think that's going to slow down, Bitcoin accelerates that. It accelerates it so much. And so jurisdictional arbitrage is the name of the game. Uh, you saw in Coinbase's uh, filing, no headquarters, no address listed. That's awesome. Uh, you know, and so let's, let's see what Bitcoin does. Again, the dreaming of the societal benefits of Bitcoin is something that, I, I, I mean, I think it's something more private. Uh, it, it gets into your politics. It gets into your, your family values. What do you hope Bitcoin creates for the future is really like how you see your best life um, and, and how, and so, you know, it's something that is a little personal and that's why I commend again, guys like Robert Breedlove who are willing to just, you know, spill it all out there and say, you know, this is going to change the world in so many different ways. Um, people like that stoke our imagination and how we see the future. So, um, yeah, I hope that I, not, I hope, I believe that Bitcoin is this, is, uh, a tool that will change the world. That's why I'm involved in Bitcoin. And um, I'm excited to see, uh, you know, to raise my daughter in a world, a Bitcoin world, and see the good that can come out of that. Yeah, this is something we've been talking, you know, uh, with my girlfriend and, and, you know, for our daughter now, who is like two months old, like, you know, what kind of world is she going to live in, you know, uh, whether I'm still alive or not, you know, after that. Uh, what's the future going to look like? You know, I mean, with everything going on right now, with all the tyrannical measures and, and things that are going on, it's, it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's worrisome. It's, it's extremely worrisome. And, um, you know, a child has, needs the, you know, the right environmental conditions to prosper, to be creative, to, you know, to think freely, to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to make the best versions out uh, of her, uh, her himself. So, yeah. So really enjoyed this talk, Nick. Um, where can people follow you? Yeah. Well, I just want to say I'm a uh, super bullish on humanity. I've uh, had uh, the ability to travel to many countries and meet people from all over the world. People are loving, brilliant. Uh, they care about the planet. They care about their families. They care about the future. And so uh, I think that Bitcoin will bring about a great change, uh, you know, going forward. People can find me 
uh, at layeredmoney.com. Go check out the book on Amazon and other retailers worldwide, Layered Money. Uh, it's a short read um, and people are people are really enjoying the book so far. So I, I hope that people will go check it out. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at time value, sorry, time value of BTC. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I mean, I can't I can, I can recommend it enough. It's I uh, got to get the hardcover too, by the way. So uh, maybe even we'll, we'll find, uh, you know, maybe we'll see each other at some conference. Hopefully in the future if we can, traveling is more, you know, eased up. So Nick, thank you so much and hope to talk to you soon in the very near future. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, how was that? Nick Batia is like a genius writer, a brilliant writer, brilliant think tank and thinker and Bitcoiner. Uh, in my, you know, in my opinion, is like uh, you know, with all his humility, is is really a genius. So, make sure you follow him, read the book, whatever ebook, hardcover, order it. It's you can read it like within a day or less, you know, within a few hours. Yeah, I had read it, but I'm still reading, you know, some 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 parts of it over and over again because it's so fascinating, not only historically but also, you know, like deeply deep into the rabbit hole of what is money, what is layered money, the intricacies, the interconnections and the implications of what it would mean eventually, you know, layered money rooted in Bitcoin or fundamentally rooted in Bitcoin. So if you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future discussions, make sure uh, you also uh, read Nick Batia's latest article on Coindesk. Uh, I'm going to put those all in the show notes and uh, layered money. His book is a bestseller right now with with uh, amazing reviews, and I can I can't recommend it uh, you know strongly enough. My name is Kevin Avani, the Kevin Avani Connection, and hope to talk to you soon. And take care. Bye.